I come from a long line of people with short tempers. My grandpa and my dad, whom I look basically just like, if I look in the mirror, I see my dad more and more every day. Quick-tempered men. Irritable. Cuss you out in a heartbeat. I'm a preacher that knows how to cuss. I try not to. I don't anymore. It naturally. From my mom's side, I get shyness. Just absolute fear. I told y'all before, when I was a kid, I was afraid to talk to my own shadow. I had an imaginary friend. I wouldn't even talk to him. I was so afraid. Much less to get up in front of a group of people and talk. Just scared to death and just start shaking. I remember trying to take a class at uh, East Carolina my sophomore year in college, a sociology class. And we had to get up in front of the class and give a speech to hear me, my old country accent. I speak a little more clearly than I did today. Where I, where I come from, we learn how to slur things together. You don't want to use too many syllables. That's just inefficient. So you, you cut a few things out, right? We didn't say tobacco. We said tobacco. We didn't say tomato. We said tomato. We didn't say potato. You can't use all those syllables. We don't have time for all that, right? <laughs> so here I am scared to death. Got to get it. And I didn't. I did not get it. My sophomore year in college, 20 years old, I did not get up there. I took a zero for a test grade because I was paralyzed in fear of public speaking. This is not natural for me. It's not natural. But God is bigger than my genetics. God is bigger than my natural predispositions. God is not limited or bound by those things. Holistic salvation. We have to have a holistic doctrine of sin. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, which, which was the first, the oldest book that we have, the oldest Christian document that we have is 1 Thessalonians. And in that, at the end of chapter 5, he says that I pray that God sanctify you holy. And sancti sanctification is is the process of salvation that we'll get into a little bit more next week, maybe. But he says, I pray that God sanctifies you wholly, completely, and that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord. A holistic doctrine of sin leads to a holistic doctrine of salvation. It's about more than just our souls. We're born that way with this predisposition to sin and we're born into a world that is managed, as I said before, managed by the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and it's led by human pride and human ego. The corruption that flows from the human heart gets codified in our laws and in our cultures and our ways of doing things. And Ephesians calls it the course of this world. It's a certain path that's been laid out to live life in a certain way. And the world that we live in is designed to get us to think, especially in America, that it's all about us. It's all about you. Every commercial. Think about every commercial you see. It's about life is about you and fulfilling your desires. There's a path that's taken, a course, a rut that we're in. And it leads to spiritual death. It cuts us off from the life that's available, the abundant life that's available in God. It says we're all by nature children of wrath, destined for hell. Now some of you have already said, oh no, the preacher's talking about hell. I thought this was a method. We don't talk about that kind of stuff in Methodist church, do we? Hell, goodness gracious, I just thought that was a cuss word. Y'all, Some of y'all just think I'm cussing now. We don't talk about what you know. Somebody who did talk about it is actually the only person who ever talked about it. You know who he was in the Bible? 
You may have heard of it. Who do you think it was? The only person ever talked about him. Jesus! Jesus Christ! Now he used hell as a metaphor. Oh, some of the other more conservative folks are saying, uh-oh, wait a minute. Slow down, preacher. Metaphor, you mean, what do you know? It's not just a metaphor. When I say metaphor, I don't mean not real. He used it as a metaphor to describe a reality. The reality of being cut off from the life of God, the love of God, the joy that's only available through God. He looked around for the worst possible image that he could find to describe this horrible reality of a person being so turned in upon themselves that they're driven away from God to the point of no return. He looked around for the worst possible imagery and we think that he probably was looking at a garbage dump that was continually burning right outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. It was called Gehenna. Now we're not 100% sure about this, but it was a garbage dump where people took their garbage and the fires of this garbage dump were continually burning. And sometimes there would be carry-on or dead bodies of animals and carcasses in this. It was just a horrible, wretched, smelly, stinky place. The most horrible image he could probably come up with. And he says, that's what it's like to be cut off from the life of God. It's a metaphor to describe a reality that is even much, much worse than the reality. Hell. Yes. Uh, that's the end result of sin. The course of this world, the ship of this world is headed for oblivion. The ways of the world will implode in upon themselves. The ways of selfishness and every person doing what's right in their own eyes cannot stand. And it will not be left standing. And Jesus is saying all those who stand with the ways of the world, the ways of selfishness, the ways of killing whoever you, you can find who doesn't agree with you, who doesn't have your same definition of reality. Let's just go kill them. Like this guy that shows up at the Family Research Council because he doesn't agree with their definition of marriage and he wants to kill people. Or like the, the, the right-wing Christian nuts who think the right thing to do is just to start killing people. Like this nut over in, uh, what was that, over in the Netherlands. That's not the way of Christ. There's, there is something worth dying for. But there's nothing that's worth committing murder. Nothing. There is something worth dying for, but nothing worth committing murder for. But the ways of this world will implode in upon itself. It cannot stand. And Jesus is saying all those who stand with it will be imploded with the ways of this world. But the kingdom of this world will be consumed by the kingdom of God. Jesus is coming, Terry. Amen, brother. He's coming. The kingdom of God is coming. It's been coming for 2,000 years. And that this age will not last. And those who stand with it will not last. It only leads to oblivion. Spiritual death. That's the rut. That's the bad news. But thank God, there's some good news. The two most beautiful words in the Bible, I think, are right here in Ephesians. In spite of all of that, it says, but God. But God. What two beautiful words, the most beautiful words in Scripture. But God, in spite of our rebellion, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ proved our rebellion and our rejection of truth for a world of lies. Because the, the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, thrive on lies. We know this, don't we? Addicts know it very well. You've got to have lies. Lies run this world. Jesus, when uh, He was tempted by the devil, I mean, think about this. 
Could you imagine some politician running for office who actually just flat out told the truth? Would they ever get in power? Some of one of truth. The world runs on lies. The world, the world, the ways of the world runs on lies. And Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil, you know what the devil tempted him? The last temptation was to make him a politician. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus. Will Willem and the bishop in the Methodist church said there's something about politics and the worship of the devil that go to hand in hand. Because they're all built on the kingdom of lies. But God, but God, even though this world we reject the truth, when we rejected Christ, we pushed the truth out of this world onto a cross. We said, we'll have none of that. The crucifixion of Christ proved the state that we're in. But God, and this is the country boy again coming out of me, God's butt is bigger than Satan's rug. God's butt is bigger than sin's rug. But God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we were cut off from God, even when we had pushed God out of the world onto a cross, even then, Jesus from that cross prayed what? Father, forgive me, for they know not what they do. It proved our depravity, and it proved God's love for us. God who is rich in mercy. By grace you have been saved. Not because we deserved it, not because we had earned it, but simply and purely out of the grace and the gift of God we have been saved. Not of our own doing so that no one has reason to boast about anything. For we are what he has made us. There are no self-made men or women in the kingdom of God. There are no such thing as a self-made man or woman in the kingdom of God. There's only people who have been made and who have become the work and the wonder-working masterpiece of God Almighty. By grace you have been saved. Through faith. Through simple trust. Are we going to trust Jesus? Or are we going to trust the world? The ways of the world are the ways of Christ. The way of Christ may lead to death. Either. But even in the face of death, because that's the, that's the card that the world, that's the only card it really has to play. It's the death card. You don't do what we want, we'll kill you. Even in the face of death, trust me. Just trust me. Trust me. In Jesus, through trust in Jesus. We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest any person should be able to boast. For we are what He has made us. Somebody translates this. We are His masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. God sets a new course for us. A new path. He sets us on a path of good works that we should Walk. Walk in me for His glory. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank You for the grace by which You have saved us. The grace by which we come into Your kingdom. That we reject the ways of this world. The ways of lust and greed and violence and evil. We thank You for calling us into Your kingdom and charting for us a new path, a new course in life. That we may walk in good works that You have laid before us. Fill us today afresh and anew, Lord, with Your Spirit. And if there's anyone here today, Lord, that's still hanging on to the ways of this world, Help them to let go and turn their lives over to you. We pray this in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord, whose grace is much, much greater than all of our sin. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand.